We're about halfway through this chapter now, and I want to switch gears. So it's worth a little review of our overview here. How does the body gain and use energy? That's really the name of the game here. And we spent a lot of time uh, describing how you predict whether a reaction is going forward or backward. Now remember, we talked about catabolism, which is how we break down larger food molecules into smaller molecules like CO2. We called that catabolism, and we said we get energy out of it. We also said that this is a process typically of oxidation. We said the opposite is true when we make larger molecules through anabolism. We have to put energy in, and that's a process typically of reduction. So it's time for us to look at all of this from a more detailed perspective. Remember, we said that there's two types of high energy intermediates we're interested in. Phosphotransfer energy, that is things like ATP, which is our phosphotransfer currency in the cell. And now it's time for us to talk about another type of high energy intermediate that's probably just as important, if not as much important as a currency. And that's called reducing power. And the parallel in this case to ATP is going to be NADH. Notice I call this NAD dot dot H. There's a reason for that. It's not how it's typically put in textbooks, but we'll come to that very soon. So in order to understand reducing power, we need to understand oxidation states of carbon. That's what this is called, this video. So let's make a note of that. Oxidation states of carbon. And I can tell you that when I was taking biochemistry or any chemistry in college, I studied oxidation reduction and I could do the problems, but I had absolutely no idea what it actually meant. And I suspect that's true for a lot of you as well. We want to understand what it means and why it's so important. First of all, I want to tell you something you may have heard of before. It's a little acronym that might be helpful to you. We sometimes use the term oil rig. Maybe you've heard of something like that before. Oxidation is losing electrons and reduction is gaining electrons. I never understood what that meant because carbon always has four pairs of electrons around it. It always has eight electrons. So what does it mean to be losing or gaining electrons? Well, really what it means is we are losing high energy electrons when we oxidize carbon. And when we say we are losing high energy electrons, we actually mean we're losing hydride ions. And let's make a note of that because that's what's really happening. A hydride ion is a proton with two electrons and it's negatively charged. So we can lose or gain hydride ions. It's a new species, but um, we have to uh, understand how it works. Okay, let's go through the oxidation states of carbon. The most reduced form of carbon would be like this carbon right here. And when we say it's the most reduced, we mean it has a lot of electrons surrounding it that are bonded to hydrogens or carbons. In fact, let's make a note of that up here. When we say most reduced, we mean many CH or CC electrons surrounding a carbon. And alkanes and alkenes and things like that tend to have a lot of those types of electrons. Now, <clears throat> let's take an example where we're going to eliminate or remove some of those electrons. I'll do it with yellow here. What if we were to take this pair of electrons and that proton, and just for the heck of it, let's take away that proton as well. What we're actually going to do is not remove a hydride ion only, but we are going to remove a hydride ion and a proton as well. So those are two different things, but they add up to be an H dot dot two, or a, essentially a molecular hydrogen uh, molecule. And so this is why we call this process sometimes dehydrogenation. because we are getting rid of 
equivalent of H2, like hydrogen gas. That's not how it happens in our body. We don't actually produce hydrogen gas. Rather, we produce a proton and a hydride ion. Now, if we remove this, notice we've got a problem, and that is suddenly we have only three bonds around this, elect uh, around this carbon. We actually have a a pair of electrons here that doesn't have a hydrogen on it. And that's a problem that we need to solve. One way we can solve that is to have these electrons right here collapse down and form a double bond. And that's what would happen if we went this direction. <clears throat> so what we can now say is that an alkene, that is a double bond, is one step higher in oxidation than an alkane. Now, what if we don't want to form a double bond? What if instead we want to add a water? Let's add a water. The water is going to show up right here. Um, it's the two H's and the O, and it's going to have the O put its electrons on that carbon. And one of the H uh, goes on to the other pair of electrons. In this case, we end up with an alcohol. And an alcohol and an alkene are therefore roughly, not exactly, but roughly the same oxidation level. They're both one oxidation level higher than an alkane. And this is where the uh, term oxidation comes from, because we're putting an oxygen on that carbon. Notice, however, that we can have an oxidation down here that doesn't involve oxygen. So that's sometimes a little tricky. Okay. Let's consider what would happen if we try to do this again. Let's now take a different hydride ion that we want to remove. Let's say we're going to remove this hydride ion, that H in the pair of electrons, and that proton. What we might see is this pair of electrons is going to collapse down and form a C double bond O. And when we do that, remember, we're removing a hydride ion and a proton, we end up with an aldehyde. So an aldehyde is one level of oxidation above an alcohol, and we should note that it's true as well that ketones, which are the other functional group that has a C double bond O like that, that is also on roughly the same par of oxidation as an aldehyde. So that is the next step up. We have oxidized this carbon twice, and we have now have two bonds to an oxygen where we used to have two bonds to a hydrogen. So we can do it again. We can now remove, uh, let's use a different color. We can now remove this hydride ion here and we can replace it with a water. So let's make a note. We're removing a hydride ion here and we replace it with a water and actually pull a proton off that water Go ahead and take a moment, pause, and draw in what you have after you replace this hydride ion that's highlighted in red with a, um, a water that's lost a proton. Okay, here's what I did. I took a proton off of water and brought in the remaining OH and replaced the hydride ion with that OH. And as you know, we now have a carboxylic acid. And we also know that that would probably lose its proton as well to become a carboxylate. So carboxylic acids and carboxylates are one step above ketones and aldehydes in oxidation. Notice the carbon now has three bonds to oxygen where there were three bonds to hydrogen. We've lost hydride ions and replaced it with oxygens. This is not the end though, despite what it says there. There's actually one more step out here. If we were to break off this carbon-carbon bond and remove that high-energy pair of electrons and replace that with an oxygen, what do you think you'd get? It's a little tricky here, but maybe you could guess. The very most highly oxidized form of carbon is where all of the bonds uh, around that carbon are actually attached to oxygen. And, of course, that means CO2. So, what does that mean? Um, I might end up going a little over my normal 10-minute rule on a video, but hang on, this is really important, and we'll finish this in just a moment. What it means is CO2 is the most oxidized, 
and it has the most CO bonds that we can have. And so let's pick this same topic up on the next video to finish off this page.